Okay, um, thanks so much and uh, greetings from Toronto where we're enjoying uh, climate disruption. We've had almost no winter this year. Um, it's quite, quite remarkable. Uh, in thanking both uh, organizers and audiences for the invitation to speak today and the opportunity, I hope, for some discussion, I also want to thank you on your courageous title, Performance of Landscape. Because landscape, as you would know, is a decidedly tricky and uh, controversial term, even if we restrict it in its references only to Western art of the past 500 years or so, or to the unexamined idea that I have on the screen at the moment that landscape is simply another word for private property. This is my favorite <laughs> sign just around the corner uh, from me here. <laughs> uh, or perhaps that landscape is just what we can see from a car as we drive by. Uh, the term landscape has been out of favor for a long time in many circles uh, with artists because, as I'll suggest, in the 60s and 70s, mainly in Europe, the UK and North America, artists wanted to get away from older European traditions of using frames for uh, pictures of the environment. More recently, many artists are inclined to engage with environments or ecologies and again see landscape as much too restrictive a practice or even a term. The term and its history are also in bad odor with some of those who want to discuss global art. Since uh, landscape is a decidedly Western and frequently imperialistic idea that not only implies ownership, but often succeeds in forming the basis for the colonial expansion of empires. Land is understood in other ways by indigenous peoples. Living in Canada, a settler colonial country par excellence, one certainty about land is the need to acknowledge the past and vibrantly ongoing presence here of Indigenous peoples. Settlers, like me, are often disrespectful or much worse. Here in the image you're looking at, we see the artist Rebecca Belmore and collaborators protesting Shell Oil's sponsorship of an exhibition in Canada, in Calgary, in 1988. An exhibition called The Spirit Sings that was supposedly about Indigenous art, but sponsored by a big oil company. I'm speaking today, as I've acknowledged, from Toronto, or Takaranto, as the Haudenosaunee peoples called it. Uh, which has been the home to many Indigenous groups for over 10,000 years. I'm certainly grateful to work on this land and seek to be in good relations with those who have taken care of it for so long. Taken seriously, a land acknowledgement is in part a recognition, I think, of landscape, belonging to and altering a place, a place that's often quite specific, both materially and culturally. If one doesn't feel personally grounded in this way, in this land, one should, I think, at a minimum, respect those who do. You've reminded me with the invitation to talk today and the theme of your uh, seminar, that landscape is in many ways performed, whether explicitly or in unacknowledged institutional settings. Looking back at my book, Landscape and Eco Art, which I'm blaming Trevor for this. He asked me to do this. I don't like looking back at my own work, so it's Trevor's fault. Um, the performance of landscape is a crucial theme that I think I underestimated or underemphasized um, in that book. Um, it's too late now. When I discussed Ruri's recordings of waterfalls in Iceland, for example, that you see here, an amazing piece, or an equally amazing piece uh, by the Canadian artist Paul Wald, uh, who does acoustic interactions with glaciers. Um, I was emphasizing the other than human qualities of ice and water in this case, uh, but I think I could have said more about performance, both the performance of those elements and the human performance. I argued in the book that major figures of land art in the 60s and 70s and many 18th and 19th century landscape painters and writers 
collaborate in an ongoing drama of articulation about aesthetics, earth science, and human society. In my current research, I continue to examine ways to interpret contemporary ecological art through its relationships to earlier engagement with the earth in the visual arts. So I'm promoting an historical view. To extend these thoughts with you today, I'll underline the potency of discussing landscape as performance in land and earth art of the mid 20th century, then in one extremely well known and I think deservedly famous eco artist today, you've probably heard of Olafur Eliasson, perhaps you've heard too much about him, uh, then in a walking work by an artist I suspect you know less well, the Haudenosaunee artist Robert Houle, and finally, in a challenging examination of ice, landscape, and science um, by the London-based artist Susan Shupley. First, though, let me say uh, more about the anything image that you were looking at earlier, the you are now entering a landscape. The work is performed, we could say, by the two signs that were there. And I'm sorry, I forgot to put my image back in, and I'm not going backwards, so <laughs> try to remember. Um, it's performed by these two signs, you're entering and you're leaving a landscape. There's even a sign that I didn't put in claiming that you're in the middle of this landscape. Even though some people thought the land was for sale and contacted the artists about the price, we could say that this conceptual art, which it was, opposes any kind of material ownership. This is the conceptual dimension of much land and earth art too a form not especially concerned with materiality or ecology at this time, but interested instead in how we define and experience landscape through performance. Whether those driving through the landscape knew it or not, Netco, anything company, uh, was performing a landscape and so were the people in that landscape. Land and earth artists of the 60s and 70s often saw landscape merely as the art of museums. Michael Heiser famously stated that working in and with the land was, quote, more interesting than looking at works in the Louvre or Metropolitan. Robert Smithson envisioned the end of landscape painting in around 1970. Earth artists wanted to use land rather than paint, let's say, as a medium. And they wanted to be outside largely, not inside. Originally and now, however, land art had a very close relationship with exhibition spaces. Aspirations to change the art system notwithstanding, the work was almost always documented and whenever it could be sold. Again, it was often performed in one way or another. Famous example on the left here, British artist Richard Long's famous walks, um, a practice that I understand your group was focused on recently, were both personal performative excursions and conceptual acts. I compare his famous work on the left with an image by Jeff Wall that pays homage to Long, but also I think recognizes the randomness, the lack of individual, let alone artistic or even aesthetic agency when landscape is defined by people's activities. These pieces are tremendously different, even though there is, I think, a homage uh, embedded in them. Jan Dibitz is shown here making a work for the Earth Art Exhibit at Cornell University in 1969. 1969 is the big year of early land art. Uh, many of the most overtly and profound performative land art works at this time were by the late Dennis, whoops, Sorry, my image just disappeared. There we go. Um, by the late uh, Dennis Oppenheim, a couple of whose uh, very famous works you see here, Timeline and Annual Rings. In both of these, he revealed the arbitrariness of human borders as opposed to natural phenomena. In this case, the river between Canada and the US, Maine and um, New Brunswick. And let's not forget that the performative land art from over 50 years ago was frequently amusing as well as revealing. Um, I wouldn't mind spending more time if we have a chance for discussion. 
on this point about some of the original contexts, uh, which were very tongue in cheek. Of course, we're deadly serious, as some people were at this time, about environmental issues. But there's an awful lot of land art like this one by Robert Morris, according to me, uh, which is not entirely serious. Um, I said earlier that I imagine that most of you are familiar with Olafur Eliasson, and I'm sorry if I'm not pronouncing that correctly. Please um, correct me later, if you will. Um, one of the best known, most prolific, but I think also most innovative artists working today anywhere on anything, though I suspect it would be good for those of us outside of Denmark if we knew about other Danish artists too. Um, some of his best known work is performative. Of course, Ice Watch, which you see here, and I imagine some of you uh, experienced it in Copenhagen in 2014, which he did in collaboration with the geologist Minnick Rossing. Uh, in Paris the following year for the COP21 uh, uh, climate discussions. And then uh, I think the most recent iteration of this, correct me again if you know otherwise, was in London uh, in 2018, where in each case roughly 80 tons of ice sourced from a fjord in Greenland uh, mark the hours of a gigantic and relentlessly melting clock. An effort to raise awareness about planetary climate disruption, it brought home to an urban audience uh, or to urban audiences, not only the effects of climate change, but also the urgent need to take collective action. What defines Ice Watch, it seems to me, and makes it popular, if that's the right word, uh, is the emotional interaction and communication between the human and the non-human ice in this case. Uh, Eliasson's installation or its performance with both human visitors and the ice as the protagonists is explicitly about the temporalities of climate change and our human interactions with a not human element in landscape or cityscape that we've largely defined. Again, it is an ice watch in two related senses as a timepiece and as a synonym in English for to observe, which might be, and again, I hope somebody will tell me if I'm wrong about this, why the title is always in English. I don't know whether you get that nice play on terms in Danish, or maybe he's just speaking the international lingua franca, I don't know. If today's eco art is a form that seeks to bring our attention to planetary climate issues and even to change our behavior towards our shared home, to the scientific and social complexities of what Gayatri Spivak calls planetarity, then it is quintessentially an art of the Anthropocene. The notion of the Anthropocene is about the interplay among geological, atmospheric, and human timeframes. Eco art and eco critical art history are also of the Anthropocene. And I think we can say the same about landscape and art, especially in its performative dimensions. This brings me to Robert Houle, and you can tell because they're so bad that these are my photographs. Um, I want to talk very briefly about this piece that he did in 1996 called a Garrison Creek Project. It's a walking work, back to performance, uh, that quietly and more or less permanently articulates the indigenous and geological presence beneath a quintessentially modern colonialist infrastructure of about five and a half million people called Toronto. Poole's work is embedded in the land. On the left, a large plaque, and on the right, small roundels. As visitors, we perform relationships to this colonial landscape, including the sewer system that replaced the creek that gives the work the name that's right underneath us. And we are, I think if we notice the piece, and most people don't know it's there, in an imagined relationship with the land in its colonial, pre-colonial and present incarnations. Anchored with an in-ground map that you see on the left and a text um, in two different parks about um, half a kilometer apart, quite near Lake Ontario, um, and joined by these roundels in the sidewalks, there are about a dozen of them that depict the area's fauna from salmon to crayfish. Um, 
the meandering installation as a whole invites us to experience the Garrison Creek project as we walk, that is, as we perform it as a landscape, as a mnemonic landscape. Both Eliasson and I think uh, Houle are hopeful that their works will reach people emotionally and perhaps enlighten them about the land and the planet. I don't deny this at all, the hopefulness. Instead of trying to show us the environmental degradation or the effects of climate change that we see in so much contemporary eco art, this is just one example. Um, if you do eco art in Toronto, it's, there's a bylaw that says that you have to mention Edward Bertinsky because he's from here um, and is somebody who details um, climate change, etc., and industrial impact. Um, but instead of trying to show us this environmental degradation to represent it in the work of Hull, and I think in most of the performative works that I've brought up, we have something different. To approach the question of presentation of what, what are these works presenting? Uh, let me quote um, a former student of mine, Hannah Nikšević, um, from a, her master's thesis at McGill University, which was titled, and I had a wonderful sort of free song when I was asked to give this talk and saw your theme. Her title was The Art of Losing, Performing Ecological Loss in Contemporary Art. Uh, Hannah Nikšević writes, crucial to one genre of ecological artwork is a total turn away from representation of ecological loss. In other words, these works subvert not simply the urge to represent ecological art loss in its entirety, but the desire to represent ecological loss at all. In so doing, artists opt instead to enact ecological loss, ultimately refusing to contradict the ontological status of loss as a passing out of existence because, and this is my gloss, it is self-contradictory and self-defeating to build an art as a monument to loss, something permanent about loss. To think in more detail about landscape, ecological art and performance, I want to conclude with Susan Shupley's complex procedures as a self-described artistic researcher. You might know Shupley's name for, from her contributions to the collective Forensic Architecture, who, and I'm quoting from their webpage here to describe their work, whose investigations employ pioneering techniques in spatial and architectural analysis, open source investigation, digital monitoring and immersive technologies, as well as documentary research situated interviews, academic collaboration, to investigate human rights violations, including violence committed by states, police, forces, military, and militaries, and corporations. Her recent book, Shipley's recent book, Material Witness, formulates the principles, practices, and stakes of careful listening to the material world. Ice cores, the work inside this larger project that I want to discuss briefly with you exemplifies these priorities. It's also part of a larger project that she calls learning for ice, learning from ice, sorry, which examines, I'm quoting from her webpage here, the politics of cold, focusing on the cryospheric environments of the Canadian Arctic. Ice cores, and I can certainly put a clip, uh, access to a clip up in the chat if people are interested later, or you can search it and find uh, a good clip of it, is a four color, four channel installation that runs at just over an hour in length. Shupley describes it as the first in a series of documentary films exploring the politics of cold. It documents, she goes on, activities in the Canadian ice core archive and the ice core quaternary geochemistry lab in the US, as well as glacial retreat at the Athabasca Glacier in the Columbia ice fields in Alberta, Canada. The film's matter of fact, camera work, narration, interviews, and facility tours with climate scientists suggest the documentary form 
but the heterogeneous soundtrack that she has evokes a hybrid form of eco art. Created by Shupli musician and composer Mohammed Safa and mastered by Philippe Kionpi, the acoustic dimensions of the work transport it to a profound level of integration from which we can actively ponder the ecological archive that is glacial ice and approach the most encompassing ecological issues threatening the earth today. These oral and visual registers work together and actually to some extent against each other in ice cores. Uh, the first moments of the film, and actually the clip I have is from near the end, but take my word for it. Uh, the first uh, moments of the film immerse us in an oddly double world, at once familiar and alien. We see a technician handling ice cores stored in long metal tubes. What we hear, however, are the rapidly oscillating sounds of Safa's music, quite otherworldly music. He combines sonorous echo-like tones with multi-pitched staccato notes. These will stop abruptly throughout the filming, allowing us to hear, for example, the uh, recognizable unwrapping of an ice core preserved in heavy plastic or its material scraping with a knife as it's prepared for analysis, very laboratory focused. Uh, Shupli elaborates that she used this layered sound to, quote, suggest a certain internal life world of ice to counter the prevailing no notion that these cores are mute witnesses to climate change lying in a dormant state in the archive. In spatial and sonic terms, the film has a double ending. After about an hour of ice core analysis indoors, we move outside to uh, an ice habitat in the far north in Nunavut, in the north of Canada, to observe how these cores are extracted. Watching the scientists work, we do, at work, we do not hear their conversations or their power tools that we can see, but only the lilt, we might say, of the ice's own voice that's provided by Safa's uh, sound. This vocalization is louder, more complex, and more insistent than our attention on our attention than it was in the laboratory settings with which the film began, where the human and technological sounds demonstrated. It's snowing lightly as Shupli films, encouraging us to remember that ice, even landscape in general, catalogs effects that begin in the atmosphere. Finally, we see a successfully harvested, wrapped and labeled ice core in the lab, that's here on the screen. Shupli slowly pans along the length of this specimen as if it were the edge of a glacier from a boat, allowing us to see the archival notion, notations on its new plastic sleeve, which you don't see here. She narrates the import of this fragment of a, quote, planetary archive, one that embodies and yields what she calls Earth evidence of a rapidly heating world over 800,000 years, some of the ice is that old. She stops at this point, but she lets the ice music, as I'll call it, continue. Part of a widespread materialist turn in art that underlines the autonomous post-human worlds of matter and our proper interactions with them, Shupli's notion of a material witness can illuminate many other examples of eco-art. And we do well to listen to her and to the ice. In your seminar program, you ask, what is the role and potential of art in a time of acute ecological crisis? The French philosopher with whom I'm sure most of you are familiar, Jacques Rancière, writes in a very well-known quotation that, quote, human beings are tied together by a certain sensory fabric a certain distribution of the sensible which defines their way of being together. Politics, Rancière writes, is about the transformation of the sensory fabric of being together. Art is political because it both inflects and infects the sensory fabric. My sense is that ecolog ecological art's role is large, but indirect. It can enlighten hearts and minds about our shared sensory fabric, 
in the landscape, and it can point to different ways of living our lives. Thank you very much. Thank you, Brian. Um, any comments or questions? Now, I just want to ask you, um, I mean, you, you've chosen this piece because, of course, you think that it somehow is uh, embedded in the work. It seems to be incredibly purist. It seems to be almost mm, literally trying to give mm, the material the, the authorship of the work. And it's almost trying to protect the authorship of the work, the, the, the authentic film. We, and, and actually change as little as possible, as, as at all possible. But at the same time, it seems also to be a um, almost a sort of classical um, staging of, of nature, an internal, internal, internalization of, of nature, in a way also uh, as a kind of a, almost as a museum, almost as a work which would fit into a museum. So I'm just, I'm just thinking from my own point of view, is this a media piece or is it an installation? It's a one hour and six minute video. Okay, okay, all right. Okay. Uh, but, the, but I just have to get it clear in my head because I can't quite, why do you choose exactly this piece? You, 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 take it as a, you see it as the next generation, the next step into, seek, into seeking a new kind of specific role in a, creative process, in a creative process, which it, which it is, but the artist in, is in denial of the, of the usually, may I say, artistic mm, authorship, right, will to interfere, or is that completely wrongly understood? Um, no, uh, that's very, very interesting, and thank you. Uh, it's a little bit unfair that I'm dropping this on you, um, you know, an hour long, documentary film without you having seen it. Um, but I really like some of the things you've said, uh, especially the museum comment, uh, Trevor, because the film, and, and there's no way that you could tell this from what I've described, um, but it's extraordinarily uh, technological and scientific. Hmm. So what you're really witnessing is people, um, climate scientists uh, working, glaciologists working with ice, and they're cutting it, they're sampling it, they're measuring its methane, etc. Mm -hmm. So on the one hand, it is displayed, it mm -hmm. is prepared. And I, I, from that point of view, it's like a museum preparation. But the other part of it um, that you also alluded to is that the ice has a kind of separate being. Mm -hmm. And that is paradoxically where the artist Shupley's uh, role comes in because of course she has literally orchestrated all of this it's not just a neutral you know scene inside various laboratories um, the ice has a voice because of the sound that she's laid over it and of course the film is very carefully um, orchestrated to give you a certain view of ice is it the next generation I don't know about that but it's certainly a huge change using this yes. medium and giving this voice to material it's a huge change from land art and earth art of 50 years ago that's for sure good okay thanks all right i think we're in a state yeah this one you want to have a comment good um you mentioned something about uh, personally belonging to a uh, space and how that uh, could oppose like a more colonialist, uh, like uh, when you take territory and um, also uh, mentioned uh, indigenous people and their relation to nature. Uh, what Could you elaborate a bit what you mean about personal, personal belonging to a space? Thank you. That's a really important question. And it's one that, as, as I suspect you know very well, is tuned to where one works and the kind of spaces and land of belonging that one is thinking about. And certainly um, here where I am in Toronto, um, 
there's a huge amount of thought about indigenous relationships to the land, not that it's one relationship. You know, there are many, many different groups of peoples uh, over a very long span of time. But I think that it would be accurate to generalize and say that that attitude towards land or what still gets called nature is very often one of stewardship and collaboration and care uh rather than uh, the other possibilities that uh, have been mooted uh in our discussions today of exploitation of various sorts so if we take robert Hool's work uh, the garrison creek project that i was using to exemplify this different relationship it is specific to the particular land of what is now downtown toronto he looks at, you know, the flora and fauna that might have lived here 10,000 years ago when we had a different climate. Uh, underneath um, the sidewalk, uh, where you see these inserts, is a creek, uh, a small river, uh, that in the 19th century was an open sewer, was eventually filled in because it was an open sewer, and then through the 19th century, it was, quote unquote, developed as a kind of proper sewer. Um, it's still there. So you have all these different layers. And uh, Hool, as an indigenous person, I think is trying to get us, all of us, to understand what is underneath our feet, what that relationship to land and landscape is. And given the topic of, of your um, colloquium, I think it's actually a performative work too, mostly for us as we walk along this path and try to um, relate to that long history. So that's what I mean by the specificity of place.